Please turn your Bibles to Mark 5. Mark 5. The title of my message this evening is The Missionary Jesus Rejected. I'll read the first two verses and then I'll go to him in prayer. Mark 5, beginning in verse 1, and this is what the word of the Lord says. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we will bless you at all times. Praise shall continually be in our mouths. Our soul makes its boast in the Lord. We magnify the Lord. And we exalt your name together. Earnestly we seek you. Our soul thirsts for you. And our flesh faints for you. We ask you to take your holy word this evening and press it upon our hearts to learn, to feel, and to obey. In Christ's name, amen. I have a pastor friend in the U.S. that has told me that he talks more people out of going into missions than going into missions. And this is not because he despises Great Commission work. Far from it. He loves missions. Rather, it's because he sees far too many people who want to go afar to evangelize, but have no desire or gifting to stay and evangelize at home. Today, we're going to look at an example of Jesus urging a man to remain right where he is in order to tell the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, by the time we get to Mark chapter 5, the disciples are staggered. It tells us they came to the other side of the sea. They came from the western side, and verse 37 of chapter 4 tells us there was a great windstorm that arose, and these seasoned fishermen were terrified. I remember years ago, I took a trip to the Comorian Islands, which is 99% Sunni Muslim. And there are three islands that are about a millimeter apart if you look at it on the globe. So when we took a little boat from Grand Comoro to Anjouan, I thought it would take a few minutes. We were nine hours on that ship. And I knew we were in for a difficult ride when they were handing out barf bags before we even left the port. And here we were in the open sea for nine hours, and at times when those waves got high, it was terrifying. Here are the disciples. They are frightened, and they they go to Jesus Christ, and Jesus comes, and he stills the storm, And the disciples say, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They should have known who he was. Contrast this to chapter 5, a few verses later, when even the demons immediately knew that Jesus was the son of the Most High. And so they arrive at the Gerasenes, which is on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, with steep cliffs running into the sea. And upon arrival we are introduced to the central character of the story alongside of Jesus, and it is the demon-possessed man of the Gerasenes. This brings us to our first point. It is this, the sinner's previous enslavement. Two words describe the demon's influence on this man's life. 
destructive and limited, ruinous and restrictive. And although this may be an extreme case in some ways, we must remember that this is the way Satan deals with God's creatures today. Let's look at some ideas of this destructive influence behind this demon. Number one, he's aggressive. Verse 2 says, And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs. He's not only aggressive, he's isolated. He's living in the tombs. Not only that, but he's dirty. He's morally dirty. Out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Fourth, he's powerful. No human, no chain could hold him. Verse 3, he lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles into pieces. I read a story recently about a man in the 1800s known at that time as the strongest man in the world. His surname was Breitbart. He was so strong that he could bend horseshoes in half. He could take sheets of metal and chains and snap them. He had a trick where he'd take a baby elephant and he would carry the baby elephant while climbing up a ladder. He met in his demise one day when he was before a crowd and he took these thick spikes in his hand and he was pounding these spikes through thick, hard oak wood that was 25 millimeters thick without a hammer, driving them into the wood. Well, he missed and drove it into his leg. He got blood poisoning. They amputated both of his legs, and he died. That was the strongest man in the world. That is this man here. He is ripping the chains. No human can hold him. He's also energetic, needing little rest. The Bible says in verse 5, night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out. He was also masochistic, cutting himself with stones, verse 5 says. Here's a man in which 6,000 demons were expended upon one man for this sole purpose, to destroy him. Regardless of anyone else, this man would not know the truth. This man would not thrive. This man would not have a family. This man would not have a job. This man would be destroyed. Lesson. Satan and his demons will do everything they can to destroy the work of God. Satan tempted Eve to sin against God. Satan tempted Jesus to sin against his father. Satan uses lies. He uses deception. He uses murder, doubt, guilt, fear, confusion, sickness, envy, pride, and slander to stop the gospel. Satan will use any tactic he can to blind people to the truth. 2 Corinthians 4.4 The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And where you find demonic influence, you find destruction. John 10.10 The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But there's good news. Because not only is Satan destructive, but he's also limited. Even though these demons are powerful and beyond the strength of the town, Jesus Christ is in total control of this situation from the moment he arrives. Let me give you several ways. First, the demons run and fall before Jesus immediately. Imagine you and your wife. You're going off on a date. You bring the babysitter over to watch the children. And while you're gone, 
She can't control them. They're climbing up the walls. They're tearing up the sofa. They're hang hanging on the chandeliers. And then, a couple hours later, mother and father return. And as they walk through the door, the children instantly change, and they run to their parents. That is these demons here. Out of control and then running to Jesus. Second, they recognize Jesus as the Son of the Most High. You know, it's one thing to know the truth as these demons did, and it's another to believe it and to love it. James 2.19 says that even the demons believe and tremble. In our evangelism among the Tongas, as I move into the gospel, it's very common for them to use religious language to let me know they're kind of a God-like Christian someone. Shikumu shikona, they say. God is here. Shikumu ishingwe, God is one. But simply believing that God is one and that God is here does not make anyone a Christian. Next, the demons beg Jesus in verse 7 to stop torturing them. We'll go to verse 6. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Well, next we find that they obey. We find in the next verse the word legion. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? Now Jesus is not asking him this question because he doesn't know the answer. Jesus is the teacher. These demons are the students. He asks them a question and they answer. And they say our name is legion. A legion was a Roman unit of 6,000 soldiers. And so there's a lot of demons that are afflicting this man. And so they ask for permission. Verse 10 and verse 12 talks about begging. They beg to go somewhere else rather than be destroyed before the final judgment, 2 Peter 2, 4, which Jesus had every right to send them to. Luke says that they ask not to be cast into the abyss, which Jesus could have done. Satan and his demons want to destroy. And if they cannot destroy God's creatures created in his image, then they will settle for second best and destroy God's creatures that are not created in his image. And so they are thrust into these 2,000 pigs and to their deaths. Verse 13 and so he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. Lesson. Satan and his demons have limited power and are under God's control. They need his permission. Think of the story of Job. Satan was like a dog seated at his master's table and dared not move even an inch, for his master's eye was always upon him. Demons do not know the future, for only God does. Isaiah 46, 9. Satan and his demons do not know our thoughts like Jesus. Matthew 9, 4. And I'd like to warn you of two extremes at this point that we could we can fall victim to when we come to this passage. Here's the first extreme. All evil and sin is from Satan and demons. It's common with charismatics. If there's disagreement among a people, we cast out the spirit of disagreement. If there's a gluttony or greed problem in the church, we want to cast out the spirit of gluttony. The problem with adultery casts out the spirit of adultery. In African traditional religion, much is blamed on demons and witchcraft. If someone is hit by a car while walking to work and dies, or if a child falls out of a tree at school and is killed, the explanation is witchcraft. Just an idea knowing how much witchcraft is a part of the minds among the people in our area, one of the most common surnames 
is witches. Baloi or valoi means witches. If a man has two wives and the children of one are healthy and the children of the other are sickly, the mother of the sickly will think that, for the most part, witchcraft is to blame. So that's the one extreme, but then we can swing to the other side, which may be more common here. And that is, no evil and sin is from Satan and demons. Uh, We don't believe in witchcraft, or this is a story in the past, or this was an extreme situation, and we don't have to worry about that today. Well, consider this. In Scripture, demonic activity is marked by false religion. Moses called false gods demons. Deuteronomy 32, they stirred God to jealousy with strange gods, with abominable practices. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, which were no gods. Another name for Allah is Satan. Following African traditional religion is following demons. Following the Pope, the Dalai Lama, the Virgin Mary, Jehovah's Witnesses, is not just Antichrist, it is demonic. The next demonic activity is marked by child sacrifice. Psalm 106, 35, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. Abortion clinics are houses of demons. Demonic activity is marked by bodily self-destruction. The prophets of Baal cried out and cut themselves. Do we not live in a world today of bodily mutilation? No, let us not think that somehow this story is not relatable to us. In fact, many people that come to Christ today will come out of similar, demonically oppressive settings just like this man. Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Well, we've looked at the sinner's previous enslavement. Here's our second point. The sinner's powerful emancipation. Emancipation means release from slavery. We find four descriptions of this new man, starting in verse 14. Mark gives us two of them. Starting in verse 15, we're told that he's clothed and in his right mind. In a similar account in Luke 8.35, Luke tells us two more, that the demons had departed him, and fourth, he was seated at the feet of Jesus. How do we explain this other than the saving power of Jesus Christ? Never has the world seen such amazing power as this. Mark 127, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Oh, brother and sister, oh, dear sinner, your sin may be great, but Jesus is greater. Your trials may be hard, but Jesus is mightier. Your despair may be deep, but Jesus' love is deeper. Your scars may be awful, but Jesus' wounds are stronger. Is this not what Jesus spoke of in Matthew 12, 29? How can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Here's what Jesus is saying. The strong man is Satan. And the world of sinners is under the bondage. And Jesus enters into his house and he binds that man, which means Jesus is freeing people from bondage and then plundering his goods. Now you would think at this point that the townspeople would be thrilled. They 
would be happy, they would be excited, but instead we're told that they begged Jesus to leave, verse 17, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Do not expect the world to rejoice at your conversion. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. We come to our final point, which is this. The sinner's persuasive evangelism. The man begs Jesus to go with him. You know, this is really a story of three beggars. The demons begged in verse 12. They begged Jesus that they could enter the pigs. The townspeople begged in verse 17. They begged Jesus that he would leave. And then the new convert begs in verse 18. And he begs Jesus that he could go along with him. True Christians... Saved by grace, do not have to be begged to be with him. It's the other way around. Paul said in Philippians 1.23, My desire is to be with Christ, which is far better. Our converse today in modern evangelicalism are the exact opposite. We have to beg them to go to church. We have to beg them to be with other Christians. We have to beg them to work up the courage to just hand out one small track. Instead, this man's new life was characterized by three things. Fellowship with Jesus, obedience to his word, and telling everyone he knew about Jesus Christ. But there's a question that we have to answer. Why did Jesus tell the man not to go with him? The verse 18, and as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him, and he did not permit him. Well, we see this actually quite often in Scripture. Sometimes Jesus tells people not to say anything, which is sometimes referred to as the messianic secret. And he does this to avoid confusion. He does this to uh, avoid the miracle seekers who will move in with the crowds and hamper the ministry which Jesus came to do. We find this in Mark 1.44. Sometimes Jesus makes it hard to follow him because he doubts the person's conversion. So he puts up barriers into, in the way to see if they're sincere. And yet here, Jesus does not doubt his conversion. In fact, he confirms his conversion by urging him to tell his family and friends about the mercy of Jesus Christ. He says, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. He says, don't go, missionary prospect. Don't go. Stay. Home evangelism. I love missions. We need missionaries. We need churches filled with home evangelists. And the man immediately obeys. He doesn't just tell his friends. He doesn't just tell his family. We're told he goes to the Decapolis. Verse 20, and he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. The Decapolis was a group of ten cities, and he, he becomes a traveling evangelist. In our world today, refusing any volunteer that wants to go seems cruel. But Jesus does that very thing. I don't want to leave our passage this evening with you thinking about a glorious conversion of an enslaved man 
who then went on to evangelize, and we walk away saying, yes, we need to evangelize more. I want to put some running shoes on those points. I want to put some teeth on it. So I'd like to close with 21 practical examples of home evangelism. Something this man might have done, and something we know that the early church did in the book of Acts. I began in Acts chapter 1, and I went through slowly, and I found every example or method of evangelism that I could find. I had dozens, but we'll see how many we can get this evening. Number one, engage in stranger evangelism. Acts 1 verse 8 tells us that we are to go to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Do you know why friendship evangelism is so popular? It's because we're terrified to share the good news with strangers. If you think about it, there's really few examples in scripture of friendship evangelism. But Acts 1.8 says that we're to preach the gospel to the remotest parts of the earth, meaning we're not to tell just our friends and just our family. Second, give the gospel in the sinner's own language. When we come to Acts 2, verses 4 and 6 and 11, we see that they were speaking in tongues, which were just foreign languages. And when the people heard the gospel in their own language, we're told they were bewildered, they were completely amazed, and they were perplexed. You want to see that kind of reaction to someone? Speak to them in their own language. And if you can't learn a language, then at least learn how to greet in their language. In our setting, Shitsanga is the golden key. It opens almost every door. When you meet someone, ask them what their home language is. Ask them how to greet. Ask them how to say hello. Ask them how to say goodbye. In, in South Africa's rainbow nation, filled with foreign languages, we ought to use language, not as a barrier. And that's what language so often is. It's an invisible barrier. It's something that's stopping me from reaching that person. But it doesn't have to be a barrier. It can be a bridge. Language is a tremendous tool to evangelize. Third, preach in the open air. Acts 2.14, Peter lifted up his voice among a group of people. This kind of preaching is needed today. Don't listen to your fear. It's terrifying. I've never met anyone who said, it's not terrifying. But there's nothing so exhilarating when you stand before a group of people that are hanging on your every word. Fourth, lifestyle evangelism. Acts 2, 44 through 47. The Bible tells us that when God's people were fellowshipping daily, and when they were acting in a holy way, and when they were living godly and righteously, Acts 2.47, and many people were saved, and they were saved daily. Now, I'm not a, a fan of lifestyle evangelism if that means I simply pay my speeding ticket and open the door for other people, but I never actually give the truth. No. We live godly lives Someone sees something's different in us, and then we give them the gospel. Tertullian was one of the great men in church history. He was one of the church fathers. He was unconverted in his early days. But then he said, when he witnessed the courage of the Christians that were killed by the lions in the Roman Colosseum, when he saw that they were willing to suffer for Christ, that is what the Lord used to bring him to salvation. Fifth. Talk to the sick and destitute. Remember the story of the apostles going up to the temple to pray, and now you have, a, you have a man who's begging? What happened? Well, let me ask you first. When you go to a robot, and you're stopped at a red light, 
and you see someone approaching your car, what do you think? Is it not this? Don't make eye contact. Look straight. Don't look that person in the eye. Touch our conscience. The apostles did the opposite. When the man came begging, Acts 3, verse 4, he says, Look at us. Look me in the eye. Roll down that window, even if it's just a little bit. You take out your gospel track. You look them in the eye and you say, I can give you this and it will change your life. Sixth, use words. You say this is the most obvious point you've given so far. Use words. Of course use words. Not common. Acts 4.31, we're told that they continued to speak the word with boldness. Have you ever heard of St. Francis of Assisi? There's even a town called St. Francis on the coast in South Africa. St. Francis of Assisi supposedly said, always preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. I've never really liked that slogan. And it turns out he never said it. I read an article recently about St. Francis of Assisi, and it was called, Was St. Francis a Sissy? <laughs> a Sissy is a coward, someone who's afraid. And the answer was, no, he wasn't. And he never said that. And the fact is, Roman does, Romans does say this, how shall they hear without a preacher? We have to use words. We have to tell that sinner at our workplace and in our neighborhood and in our family the gospel of Jesus Christ. We use words. And if we don't use words, they will never hear the story that we were born sinners. We were born children of Satan. We love darkness rather than light because our deeds are evil. And yet Jesus Christ came to earth, God in the flesh, lived the perfect life, went to the cross, did for sinners what we could not do for ourselves, three days later rose again and gives eternal life to all those who repent of their sins and trust in Christ alone. That's the good news that we must give with words. Seventh, give to and promote gospel projects. Acts 4, 32 through 37, we find that the believers at that time had all things in common. There were no needs. They were constantly giving. There are so many Christian evangelistic ministries that we can give to. Livingwaters.com is one of my favorite websites Thousands of tracks, hundreds of videos. Go there, support the ministry, buy tracks, fill your car up with gospel literature. And if you have a child at your home who no longer listens to the gospel message, then you need to do this. Gather the family for family worship in the evening and tell them you're going to watch a movie. Sit down on the sofa, go to livingwaters.com, and pull up any video, 15 minutes, of a gospel presentation. And oftentimes there will be tears of laughter and there will be tears of joy. And they will hear the gospel. Eighth, go house to house. Acts 5.42, Acts 18.7, Acts 20 verse 20. Yes, this can be terrifying. Go house to house with the gospel. Ninth, Encourage evangelism immediately after conversion. That's what we found with the man here, the demon-possessed man. That's what we find with the woman at the well. After a person is conversion, don't just use spiritual-sounding language which says, now you need to worship God. Well, yes, we need to worship God, but you cannot worship God if you do not obey him. And that we are told to obey the command to give the gospel to every creature. 
10th. Gather when it is dangerous. Acts 5, 12 through 13. The Bible says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And when we fail to evangelize and when we fail to gather when it is dangerous, what we're really saying is we're ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 11. Add different voices. Uh, We find this in chapter 8, chapter 11. Sometimes when something was happening, they sent Barnabas. Other times they sent Peter, they sent John. Do you have a tough nut to crack in your workplace or in your home? Bring in another voice. Sometimes another voice is just what's needed. Bring in a pastor, bring in a deacon, bring in an elderly lady who just has a way with people. Bring in another voice. Twelfth, free your pastor to evangelize. Acts 6. Here comes the deacons. They need to give themselves to the ministry of prayer and to the word and to evangelize. Free your pastor to evangelize. 13. Pray and sing in public so others can hear you. When you go to a restaurant and the food comes, what do you do? We pray to ourselves. How many of you pray with a whisper? How many of you pray with one eye open? Well, we don't want to bother those around us. Remember the story of Paul and Silas when they prayed and sang in prison and they prayed and sang in prison so that others could hear them. The Bible tells us that the prisoners were listening to them and evidently the prison guard was among them because he was later converted. Look, we're not interested in praying on the street corners so that we can simply be seen. Jesus condemned that in Matthew 6. But we ought to pray as a testimony to Christ. And we ought to find ways whenever we're with people, especially unbelievers, that when we part, we say, hey, let's just pray. You know, there's a lot of people who will reject a tract, and they might reject your message, but it's a rare person who will say, I don't want prayer. And you can give the gospel in your prayer. A few days ago, we came down to Joburg, and we purchased the piano. I was with my family, and we were buying it from a single lady. And I told Melinda, I don't know how we're going to move this piano. It's only me. We get to her house, and she's living with her boyfriend. And out from behind comes her boyfriend, and he was a bodybuilder. I thought, this is great. And not only was he a bodybuilder, but he was a boxer. He used to live out in Los Angeles. He came back. They were living together. I saw this is great. So here, the bodybuilder and I, we're moving the piano, and I'm trying to find ways to work in the gospel. And we just got parts and bits and pieces in. And finally, when we loaded everything and we were ready to go, here was a boyfriend and girlfriend later on in life living together. I said, hey, let's just, let's just pray together. We got together in a group, and I start praying and asking Jesus to do his work of the gospel, and suddenly I, I opened one eye. And the boxer is crying. He's weeping. And then there's the lady in front of me, and she's watering the pavement with her tears. That was through prayer, and I gave the gospel in that prayer. Pray and sing in public so others can hear you. Next, bring people into your home. Remember the story in Acts 18 of Apollos, Priscilla, and Aquila? Brought them into their home, gave the gospel. Great opportunity. Cyprian in Carthage was one of the church fathers, but before he was a church father, he was lost. He actually wasn't converted until his mid-40s when a man who was living in his home gave him the gospel, and he was converted. Next, debate. Acts 17, 18, Acts 18, 28. We're told the story when the Epicureans and the Stoics conversed with Paul. That word conversed means to express differences of opinion in a forceful way. Well, I I don't like to really use language that might hurt someone's 
feelings. The word converse means to present contrasting viewpoints. It means to debate or discuss forcefully. It's a great method to use on college campuses. I had a debate with a Muslim many years ago, and there was hundreds of Muslims there, and as far as I know, there was no conversions among them. But there was a Venda man who heard the debate. <clears throat> he later professed Christ. He shared Christ with his sister. His sister was converted. She was baptized, and now she's one of the strongest members at Seth's church. Debate. Next, teach outside the box. How many of you thought in your mind just before when I said house to house, did you say, oh, we can't do that. This is the new South Africa. I, I don't have to do that anymore. In the past, we could do that, but now there's palisades and gates and electric fences, and we don't do door-to-door -door anymore. Then think outside the box. Remember the story of Paul in Acts 16? His method was to go to the synagogues and give the gospel but now he comes to Philippi and there's no synagogue. So he said, all right, well, what am I supposed to do? I'll just wait till the next town. No. What Paul did was he thought outside the box. He went down to the river. He found some women. He gave the gospel. And they were converted. Try something new. Next. Pass on good evangelistic preaching. You hear a good sermon. It's so easy today in our technological world. Pass it on to the next person. John Owen, one of the great Puritans, when he was 26 years old, still unconverted, he was going to a church service with his friend. There was a famous preacher who was supposed to bring the word. For whatever reason, that man was not there. And his friend said, oh, let's go somewhere else and hear another famous preacher. And Owen said, no, I want to stay here. <clears throat> I want to hear this sermon. The man preached on Matthew 8, 26. Why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? And Owen was converted. <clears throat> Give good sermons to other people. Well, there's many more that I could give. Give away good literature. John Bunyan was converted when his wife brought two books into their home after their wedding. He read the two books and was converted. John Huss, the great pre-reformer before Martin Luther was converted by reading a evangelistic cartoon. I'll close with this one. Rebuke the sin of others. How many of your friends are doing wrong and you know it and you're fearful to tell them? Of course, Speak in a spirit of love, in a spirit of meekness, in a spirit of gentleness. But do not fall into the trap that says love never says a harsh word. No, love rejoices in the truth. There's a story of John Hooper. He was one of the great Marian martyrs. And on one occasion, there was a wealthy man named Sir Kingston who was committing adultery, and John Hooper rebuked him for his sin. Kingsley was so irate and angry, he cursed Hooper and punched him in the face. Fast forward many years. John Hooper, Bloody Mary, day before his execution. Here's a knock on his cell door. Who is it? It's Sir Kingston. Same man. He weeps before John Hooper and says, I thank God that I know you since God chose you to call me a lost child. This evening, we learned a tremendous story about a man enslaved in sin who was powerfully converted and immediately used his testimony to stay at home and give the gospel. Let us as a church use these ways to share Jesus Christ with every creature to the glory of God the Father. Let us close in prayer. Father, forgive us for our cold hearts. Forgive us for our lack of fervor to give Jesus to a lost and dying world. 
Forgive us for our theological excuses, for our laziness, for our ignorance. Use us as a church to give the truth of Jesus to many who do not know it. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. What an encouragement. I came home yesterday and said to my family, 